excited to have Dr. Johnson with us today, who is the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship and Director of the Urban Investment Strategy Center at the Frank Hawkins Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. Um, Dr. Johnson and Dr. John D. Casarda co-authored The Economic Impact of the African American Population on the State of North Carolina and a study on the economic impact of North Carolina's Hispanic population. Um, he examines the causes and consequences of growing inequality in American society, particularly as it affects socially and economically disadvantaged youth, entrepreneurial approaches to poverty, poverty alleviation, job creation, and community development, inter-ethnic minority conflict in advanced industrial societies, and business demography and workforce diversity issues. And his latest book is Prismatic Metropolis, Inequality in Los Angeles. So we have a truly distinguished um, leader. He might not want to have all these accolades, but he, he's done the work. And, and so we are excited to have him with us today to share about those demographic shifts in North Carolina. So without further ado, I will give it over to Dr. Jim Johnson. Good morning, all. Uh, Nafia, thank you very much uh, for your kind words. And Tamika, thank you. It's always great to share uh, the podium with you. Uh, good people, uh, uh, let me begin by thanking all of you for the work that you do on the behalf of the citizens of uh, the state of North Carolina, people who deserve uh, a hand up and opportunity in the midst of uh, a climate and society and set of conditions that I, I call certain uncertainty where the uh, pandemic was just one of a whole series of volatile situations that uh, families, uh, particularly uh, low wealth families have had to deal with uh, in our society and uh, some of the work that we've had the good fortune of doing with uh, the, uh, the great leader of the North Carolina Community Action Association, Sharon Goodson and her uh, outstanding staff. Um, I take my hat off to all of you because all of the work that we have done engaging uh, families uh, and their lived experiences of COVID, uh, the, the one common thread that runs through all of the work and the interviews and focus groups that we've conducted on behalf of the North Carolina Community Action Association uh, says that, um, as Tamika pointed out, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was the local community action agencies that came to the rescue. Yes, all of the uh, supports that the federal government and state government had in place, but at the end of the day, it was the community action agencies uh, that uh, proved to be the bridge to some sense of, of sustainability. Uh, and so um, let me thank you all for the work that you've done in uh, over the last 18 months to two years, uh, helping low-income families, low-wealth families navigate uh, the new normal of what I call the certain uncertainty uh, moving forward. Uh, having said that, um, I would like to spend uh, my time today with you, uh, and thank you for the opportunity of being with you, and sharing with you a set of forces that I think um, will continue to challenge us moving forward. And I would characterize my talk today is helping you uh, see around the corner well before you get to it. Uh, to use a hockey analogy, I want to help you skate not to where the puck is today, but rather skate to where it's headed demographically. I want to talk about what I see as some gale force demographic wind gusts ahead that uh, are going to dramatically transform uh, the work that we will have to do uh, to eliminate, minimize, eliminate growing inequality in our society. I want to begin by talking about North Carolina's population boom uh, and then shift to talking about uh, the demographic winners and losers and what we've seen in our, our state. Uh, and uh, based on the 20, uh, 20 census, I want to share with you uh, what I uh, have characterized as seven gale force wind gusts that uh, we are facing 
and that we will have uh, to come up with uh, major strategies to deal with these gale force wind gusts uh, if we are to remain a highly attractive place to live, work and play and do business uh, as a state moving forward uh, and then talk about key takeaways and hopefully there will be ample time for all of us to have discussions. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, as we move through uh, this discussion. <clears throat> So I want to begin by talking about North Carolina's population boom. And I always say when I talk about our state uh, demographically, I think we have been for the last several decades, all that in a bag of chips plus dip uh, in terms of uh, the demographic growth that we have experienced um, uh, over this period. And our growth and our experience in North Carolina is rooted in a larger context of what has been happening and going on in the Southern United States uh, as a whole. Uh, and um, one of my big trends and in in, in, in one of my demographic study uh, talks that I typically do, I talk about the South rising again. Uh, all of you know the history of the South, uh, and you know that for much of, of our history, it was an economically backwards region. It had all kinds of racial problems. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, historically, uh, really up until around 1970, the South was the place to leave as opposed to the place to be or stay or to come to. And you can see that very clearly in the data on the, the population growth of our region. If you look at this slide, what you will see is that between about 1910 until about 1970, the South only captured about 30% of net national population growth in our, in our country in every decade. Uh, and you know, the reason for that was more people were leaving than were coming to the region. You know your history. We had two gr uh, great migrations, particularly of African Americans out of the South in and around World War I and in and around World War II. Uh, it was the place to leave and few people wanted to move to the region. So to the extent that the region grew during this period, it was largely due to an excess of births over deaths because so many people were leaving the region. And then around 1970, something profound occurred, good people, and it continues to the present. In every decade since 1970, the South has captured about half of net national population growth in this country. Um, we have, in essence, gone from a region where we speak two languages, English and bad English, to one today that we speak well over uh, 300 different languages. We have become the demographic destination, the migration destination in the country, the primary place for people to move and everybody is moving to the region. Uh, every racial and ethnic group, uh, the farm born, the native born, everybody is moving to the region. And, uh, and but it's, it's uneven growth. If you look at the South, uh, we, you know, it's really, this growth is about five states within the South. It's about Texas, it's about Florida, it's about Georgia, it's about North Carolina, and it's about Virginia. If you look at the net growth of about 11 million people uh, uh, between 2010 and 2020, 79% of that growth occurred in those five, what we call migration magnet states, and North Carolina is one of them. At 79% of that 11 million people concentrated in those five states, it doesn't mean the other southern states aren't growing, but they're not growing to the extent that those five states are growing. What you will notice in this graph, the bottom bar, only 21% of that growth in the South was concentrated in other southern states. How, we talk about Texas and Florida as being immigrant gateways, mature migration destinations, and Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia, newly emerging uh, uh, destinations for uh, a very diverse population that is dramatically transforming all of everything that we do. These kinds of changes that we're talking about and the emergence of the South and North Carolina in particular as a 
migration destination means that all of our social, economic, and political institutions are going to change. Uh, including the workforce, including workplaces and consumer markets. And I dare say, good people, the work that you do will have to change dramatically given the kinds of demographic transformations, the implications on families and living arrangements uh, and what it means to work on a daily basis. It was changing dramatically and we will have to make adjustments. And so if you look at the data, what you see is uh, we basically uh, in North Carolina have added about 3.8 million people to our population since 1990, uh, since 1990, a 59% growth rate. Uh, that's huge by any standards uh, of growth. When you look at the kinds of changes that we we're talking about, uh, we've become one of the, the prime, the third most attractive migration destination in the country during that period, uh, 3.8 million newcomers since 1990. And if you look at the data very carefully, the lower right-hand corner of this graphic, you will see uh, that North Carolina in 2017 was the third most attractive destination destination, good people every day, seven days a week, 365 days of 2017, we had 194 newcomers arriving in the state of North Carolina every day. That's 194 people net every day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. You will note that the two most most attractive migration destinations during that period was, were Florida and Arizona, but we were the third most attractive destination uh, in the country as a place for people to move. If you look at the upper left-hand cor uh, corner of this graphic, what you will note is, where were those people coming from? For the most part, New York, the state of New York was losing uh, every day, seven days a week, during six, five days of the year, 458 people every day leaving New York, about 395 leaving Illinois, 378 leaving California, about 200,000 200 every day leaving New Jersey. You see the list up there. We have been the beneficiary of a lot of that out migration from those states. Uh, North Carolina has been one of the prime destinations for these migrant newcomers, these newcomers that are arriving uh, in the state of North Carolina. If you look at it over ten year, uh, the eight year period, 2010 to 2018, aggregate the my net flows, what it means is that over that 2010 to 2018 period, every day, seven days a week, during 65 days of the year, we re registered 151 net newcomers to our state every day during that, that uh, period, 2010 to 2018. This migration is transforming, has transformed, will continue to transform uh, our population in this state moving uh, forward. There's going to be some, provi pro uh, some provi provisions in all of that, but I'll get to those in just a minute. And people are coming to North Carolina from every other state in the nation. They're coming from large metropolitan areas. They're coming from medium-sized metropolitan areas. They're coming from micropolitan areas, small towns and the like. Every state uh, between 2013 and 2017, you can see on this graphic, except Nevada, had somebody that arrived in North Carolina from one of those places. And I assure you, if we extend it to the entire decade, every state, we have newcomers from every state in the nation that are uh, moving to North Carolina and settling in our community. And who are they? A lot of it is immigrant driven. You didn't even see it on the preceding map because a lot of the people who are arriving in our, in our state are foreign born. They're arriving from abroad. They're moving directly from uh, international origins and arriving and settling in North Carolina. And oftentimes uh, there are people who move to other states from abroad initially and then relocate to North Carolina. But we have benefited from that uh, immigration to the 
to, to the U.S. and North Carolina has become a major uh, kind of destination. You will note that in 1960, uh, we had less than one, one less than one percent of our population was foreign born. You see that in sharp increase. Uh, 2018, about. 8%, I think today is pretty close to about 10% of North Carolina's population is foreign born, uh, con contributing to the diversity of our state. Uh, we are moved from a state that has been uh, predominantly black and white uh, to a far more diverse kind of community. If you look at this graphic 1990 to 2018, what you will see is that what has driven growth has been that farm born population, that immigrant population, uh, uh, and the Hispanic Latinx population, Asians and Pacific Islanders. This is this graphic reflects what I call the browning of America, because you see that it is growth because most of those immigrants are largely from Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. These are people of color who are transforming our the complexion and composition of our population. Uh, and doesn't mean other groups aren't growing, but they're not growing nearly as rapidly as the uh, uh, ethnic, racial and ethnic groups that fall under the umbrella of people of color. We're talking about a profound shift in our uh, in both the racial and ethnic composition of our population, and in terms of nativity, uh, with a growing share of our population that is foreign born, we have become global, if you will, in terms of the way we uh, look uh, demographically. And the newcomers to our state have brought what we call a migration dividend. Uh, when you look at the newcomers, they have a higher per capita adjusted gross income than the people who are leaving and higher than the people who didn't move that are long-term residents of our state. So if you will look at this graphic from uh, moving from the left to the right, the left box are people who moved into the state of North Carolina. The middle box, at the same time, some people are moving in, other people are leaving. Those are the people who left uh, the state during this period. And the far right box are people who did not move. Those are long-term residents. Focus, if you will, on we've unpacked this by age. These are data from the Internal Revenue Service. When you file your taxes, uh, if you have moved between tax filing years, they create a file on, on whether you are a migrant or not, and they, they also know where you move to so we can follow and track individuals. Focus, if you will, on the 55 plus population in this graphic. What you will notice is that the average household with a household head 55 or older moving into North Carolina during this period had a per capita adjusted gross income of about $63,546. The same person in that same age range leaving the state during that period had a adjusted per capita per capita adjusted gross income of about $56,000 and the person who did not move that was 55 or older had a adjusted per capita income of about $48,000. So when you compare the non-migrant who's 55 or older with the incoming migrant who's 55 or older, that person coming in brought a migration dividend of the, that value was valued at about $15,000 more than the person who lives here in that same age category. And the person coming in had a, a, a adjusted gross income was about $7,000 higher than the person leaving the state. So what does that mean? It means that the people coming in contributed to growth in the aggregate consumer purchasing power of the citizens of North Carolina. They contributed to uh, additional business receipts as they spent money in our economy, and they were the added value in terms of tax revenue in our state. If you look at all of the age categories in this graphic, what you will notice is in all age groups for all migrants, the people coming in brought adjusted gross incomes that were higher than the people who were leaving and higher than the people who were 
our long-term residents in our state. That's a good thing to have a migration dividend that the people coming in add value because they have additional resources uh, uh, going. And, and that's why everybody touts, you know, us as being, you know, all that in a bag of chips plus a deal. Unfortunately, there are demographic winners and losers in this population boom, that 3.8 million people over, you know, since 1990 arriving in our state, uh, uh, most of them uh, better off than the people who uh, live here and the people who are leaving our state. We added about 903,000 people to the North Carolina population between 2010 and 2020. 47% of that growth was in two counties. Wake and Mecklenburg, 64% of it was in five counties, Wake, Mecklenburg, Durham, Guilford, and Cabarrus, 84% in 10 counties, you see them, they're additive, and 95% of growth occurred in 15 counties. As you all know, we have 100 counties in North Carolina. Of that boom in growth, it was highly concentrated, 95% of it, in 15 counties. <clears throat> what that means is the people coming, particularly during the pandemic, we called them pandemic refugees, when large numbers of people were leaving major urban centers in the Northeast and the Midwest and out West, those densely settled communities, many of them fled to places like North Carolina and this is from our study that we did in partnership with the North Carolina Community Action Association on the lived experiences of COVID. Uh, this is what uh, one uh, key informant in Western North Carolina working, representing a community in Western North Carolina had this to say about the influx of pandemic refugees. He said, wow, do we need affordable housing? With people fleeing the city, every house that's for sale in this community is gone. Their outsiders are buying these houses sight unseen. They're coming here. They don't even go into the home. They're buying them online and they're fleeing the city. I've got people from New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Florida. They're all coming here. There's no affordable housing. That was a problem before the pandemic. Now it's a real problem. And you see on the right side, uh, another person from the same community talked about having a billion dollars in real estate sales uh, in 2020, uh, talking about where they were coming from and that they are dri driving up the, the property values and the cost of housing. And so that any affordable, uh, any vacant property that was, was quote unquote affordable prior to the pandemic has increased so astronomically that now it's uh, not even cost effective uh, to uh, produce uh, what we call affordable housing. What I will say is that uh, one of our challenges moving forward is that as we grow and particularly in those uh, rapidly growing migration magnet counties, uh, one of the downsides is that we end up pricing out of those markets people, the long-term residents. And it poses a major challenge for us because we end up pricing out uh, civil servants uh, and public school teachers and other people who are uh, literally paid to protect, to, to protect public health and safety and to educate our children. They are priced out of these markets. Uh, I can tell you firsthand because we uh, have a school for vulnerable children in Durham, North Carolina, that is growing so rapidly and you know the prices are escalating so high. Uh, two years ago, I had four homeless teachers at the school, all with master's degrees. And so what we're seeing is in parts of the reality of the boom and growth, we're, we're seeing a large number of people priced out. And this whole notion of affordable housing is something that is really, really a major issue. Um, this is what another Western North Carolina key informant in our study on the lived experiences of COVID had to say, he said, we've seen our population change. We're a population of about 17,000 people, eight golf courses and two ski resorts. Uh, 
he talked about when these people chose to flee the city and come to homes in the mountain during the pandemic, so the population grew from about 17,800 to about 27,000 people. Uh, so much rapid growth driving up the price of housing. And this leader in the community talked about the impact on just his solid waste division of his county. He said, these people came in, uh, they, they wanted to refurbish houses, to, you know, the, the, the ability to just stay up and keep up with garbage pickup and the like uh, stressed and strained his local um, staff and, and solid waste division because those people wanted to re, uh, rehab and other folks were on lockdown. They chose to clean up and dump stuff and the like. It, it strained all of our social and economic institute, political institutions and service institutions, but most importantly, this notion created a huge problem for the people that all of us love and care about in terms of their ability to have affordable housing uh, in communities because um, our migration dividend on the one hand uh, is good for our economy, on the other hand, it is creating inequality in our society that we have to deal with moving forward. That pandemic refugee thing, the large number of people who are, were fleeing, uh, you know, major urban centers is part of a longer term, term uh, trend that has been going on. These are the, this is a map of the, of, of, of out migration field. These are people who fled New York City and headed and, and moved to North Carolina between 2017 and 2018. The pandemic merely accelerated that whole shift uh, to our state. Uh, and so the downside and the issue and challenge that we have to figure out uh, is how do we uh, balance gentrification as it were, it's called gentrification, large numbers of people who are relatively well off coming in, buying up property, driving up property, uh, uh, values and the like, pricing people out of the local residents. How do we balance that with an affordable housing strategy, a workforce housing strategy uh, moving forward? Uh, you can't have a safe community if the police officers, fire personnel, EMS workers, garbage, uh, uh, waste disposal workers and the like cannot afford to live in the very community that they're supposed to be providing services and protecting public health and safety. If school teachers can't live there, these are the kinds of challenges that we face uh, in trying to balance the value add of newcomers coming in and long-term residents. I give you a concrete example and an experience that I had to, 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 to give you a better sense of how big this problem is. Um, I was out walking in my neighborhood uh, a couple of months ago and ran into one of my neighbors who had decided that they were moving. They were moving to Florida because her husband was a football coach and he got a job at, uh, at a, a, a university in Florida. They had their house on the market uh, put it on on uh, uh, Friday, and within two hours of it being on the market, they had a full priced offer for the house, and they were scheduled for a uh, open house on Saturday. The buyers, sight unseen, gave them fifty thousand dollars in cash not to have the open house the next day. That gives you some sense of the way this market is operating. And, but the challenges that we have is how do we deal with the inequality that undergirds that? So those, those migration magnet counties, uh, I, I'm not arguing that we need to try to stop migration. What I'm saying is our work in dealing with the downside, the inequality side is, is monumental because you can't have a civil society, a safe community, if you don't have the very people there that are able to protect public health and safety and provide the services that all of us need in society. So you got 15 counties with all the boom growth. What about the other 85 counties? I wanna focus your attention on the purple counties in this map. There are 22 of them. In these counties between 2010 and 2019, deaths exceeded births and out-migration exceeded in-migration. 
when your death succeed births and more people are leaving than are going or moving to your county, you are literally a dying county because death succeed births and out migration exceeds in migration. These are the places where, as many of you know, where hospitals are closing or at risk of closing, where the young people have left, leaving behind an aging population uh, that is disproportionately oftentimes females because men die sooner than women at all ages, where isolation and loneliness are a major issue, the equivalent of smoking 14 cigarettes a day uh, in society, where there's no broadband, so telehealth and all those kinds of things become or uh, inadequate broadband access to be able to, to, to benefit from telehealth and those kinds of things. These are the kinds of issues at the other extreme of the, the uh, demographic experience in our state that we're having. Basically, if you look at the bottom three colors in this map, all of those places lost population uh, during the 2010-2019 period, uh, all kinds of challenges that we have. And so our work is getting more challenging based on the demographic changes that we're experiencing uh, in our state. And if you look at statistics from 2019, we had 65 counties in 2019 where deaths exceeded births. In 29 and 65 counties, deaths exceeded births in the state of North Carolina. That's a huge kind of challenge for us moving forward. It has, a, it has all kinds of implications. All of the red counties on this map for the total population more people died than were born in those counties. The only growth poles are, you know, the places where births exceeded deaths uh, in this, the orange counties in this map. So 65 out of 100 counties, more people died than were born in 2019. Think about that in the sense of, of your tax base for your community, the kinds of services that are available uh, uh, and your ability to attract new talent to maintain uh, in institutions. Think about the school age population moving forward and all of that, th those things are up for grabs moving forward. And so those demographic winners and losers are between those migration magnet counties and the 65 counties where more people are dying than are being born and where we have all kinds of, of issues and challenges in providing uh, and ensuring that families are able to form and maintain stable uh, lives and existence and have access to uh, you know, good jobs that pay them livable wages that enable them to maintain their family arrangements in a stable kind of situation. Large numbers of people who are elderly, isolated, and how do we think about those kinds of, of issues? And so, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, right now, we hear a lot of talk about uh, worker shortages and you know how can we have all these worker shortages and you know when people uh, are leaving jobs and things of that nature. Um, I think that that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, and the eye of an impending demographic storm that those of us that care about you know, inequality issues and poverty. Uh, we're going to have to step up our game because of these demographic gale force winds, and I want to share them with you. There are seven of them. What gets masked in the rapid growth that we're experiencing when you look long term, we're actually in a period of both slowing total and foreign born population growth and the white population is actually in decline. That's three of them. The fourth one is below replacement level fertility. And those are the four that are long-term kinds of trends that have been going on, but we have not been paying close attention to them. The last three on this graphic, are part and parcel product of recent crises that we've experienced, including COVID-19. What are they? 
deaths of despair and declining life expectancy. We have a group of people who are 55 or older who are boomers who have retired involuntarily during the pandemic. They didn't want to retire. They volunteered involuntarily for various reasons. Uh, and I'll come to them and describe them to you. And we see this huge decline in female labor force participation. Let's talk about each one of them and then think about what our challenges are moving forward and how we deal with these issues. Flow and pop population growth first. This is my gale force win number one. If you look at the United States and look at the growth of our population over a hundred year period from 1920 to 2020, what you will see is, and notice in this graphic is that we experienced peak growth in our population in 1960. When the population grew during the 50s, ultimately in 1960, at 18 and a half percent. You will note that ever since 1960, the rate of growth has declined. It's fluctuated a little bit, but it has been much less than in 1960 when it was at 18 and a half percent, such that in the last decade, 2010 to 2020, we experienced the second slowest rate of growth in the United States since we started taking the census in 1790. The slowest rate of growth occurred, as you see in this graphic, in, in, the in 1940, which means it was during the decade of the Great Depression. We only grew by a tenth of a percent greater than growth was in the Great Depression. So we're experiencing the rate of growth in our population is slowing and it's been on that downward project trajectory that is masked in the aggregate statistics that we get, get and, and, and experience moving forward. And so when you look at it in absolute terms, what you will see is that the U.S. population in terms of absolute growth peaked in, 19, in the 1990s when we added 32.7 million people to our population. But you will note as you move up on the left-hand side of this graphic, slower population growth. We dropped, we, we, we dropped to 27.3 million during the first decade of the uh, millennium and we dropped further to 22.7 million net growth in our population uh, uh, in uh, the, the most recent decade. In North Carolina, what you will note on the right-hand side, you'll see that we added about 1.4, 1.5 million people to our population in the 90s and the first decade of the new millennium. But for the first time in three decades, we added less than a million people to our population. We, we, are, we grew by 500,000 less during the most recent decade than we did in the pre previous two decades. So we got highly concentrated growth in about 15 counties and slowing total growth and, 80, and 85 counties where, you know, Deaths are exceeding births in a lot of communities and 65 of them. That's the kind of, of, of a slowing growth that we have to be mindful of. We dropped from growing by 21% in the 90s to growing by about 9%, almost, you know, 9.4, about 10% uh, during the, the most recent decade. So that slowing growth raises a whole series of questions about our ability to deal with uh, inequality moving forward as we think about it. At the same time, I painted a picture for you earlier that much of our growth was due, was due to immigration. So you got to look at foreign population growth. And what we know, this is a, a, a Gale Force wind gust number two. What we know is that so has foreign population growth began to decline. Uh, and you look at it for the United States on the left-hand side of this graphic, you see that we added about our foreign population grew by about 11.3 million 
or 57 percent during the 1990s. It dropped down to about 7.5, 7.6 million in 2000, 24 percent growth rate. 2010 to 2019, it dropped to 13.7 percent or about 5.3 million. And 2016, 2019, during President Trump years, it dropped to 1.2 million, 2.7 uh, percent growth. What's the significance of that decline? Immigration is an age selective process. Far more young people migrate and immigrate than older people. And immigrants are far more entrepreneurial than native born people. And if you look at innovation, our innovation economy and all of the you know, Silicon Valley, big companies that were rooted there and some of them move into North Carolina now, uh, the, the CEO or co-CEO or the chief strategy officer or whatever, many of them were immigrants, are immigrants. Uh, immigrants built this country and uh, contributed to transforming our communities, creating business and job opportunities. But you see that slow in growth and you see a similar pattern on the right hand side of this graphic when you look at North Carolina as well the absolute change in our foreign born population, the numbers are going in the wrong direction. And part of our slowing growth has to do with a slowing of foreign population growth, both nationally and in North Carolina. And it's something that we have to pay attention to. Probably the biggest thing that grew out of the uh, 20, 20 census, although we had signals that it was about to occur earlier, is go at Gale Force when number three, white population decline. Good people for the first time in history between 2010 and 2020, the white population in the United States declined by 5.1 million people or about 2.6%. You could see signs that that was coming though if you looked at the growth in the white population during the 1990s and the 2000s, left-hand box, what you will see is that the white population grew by about 3.4% in the 90s, 6.4 million, but it dropped to 1.2% growth in the 2000s or the new first decade of new millennium. We only added 2.3 million whites to our population, the growth rate of 1.2%. And then in the most recent decade, we saw white population decline for the first time in history nationally in our com community. In North Carolina, we haven't reached white population decline yet, but what you will see, it is trending in that direction. In the 1990s, we grew by about 13% in terms of white population growth, 676,000 uh, growth in the white population. It dropped to 10% growth in the first decade of the new millennium, 577,000. But look at 2010 to 2020, the net growth in the white population in North Carolina was 88,000 people. Uh, it is trending in that same direction. So this notion of white population decline uh, is something that uh, we need to be mindful of. And uh, the white share of net growth in our population uh, went from about 19 uh, percent, close to, let's say, 20 percent of net growth in the 90s. It dropped to 8 percent in the first decade of the new millennium. And the white population did not contribute to the 22 million people net grain in our population in the U.S. because the white population declined by 5.1 percent. When, you, when your white population declines, all of your growth is due to people who are non-white or people of color. That's what we call the browning of America. Uh, but uh, this is the first time in history that we've seen that kind of population change. And it is nationwide in every region of the country between 19, between 2010 and 2020, the white population declined. From the nation as a whole, it declined by 5.1% in the Northeast, 3.9% in the Midwest. White population here in the South declined by 1.8% and out West by 1.4%. This is a major trend that is occurring in our nation today. And it has enormous implications. When you look at it on a state by state basis, 35 states out of the 50 states lost white population uh, between 2010 and 2020. Only 15 states plus the District of Columbia 
uh, D.C. experienced white population growth. North Carolina was one of them, but our white population grew by 1.4 percent during the first decade of the new millennium. It is not unreasonable to believe if current trends continue that we will join those other 35 states that have experienced white population loss moving forward. And so we have some major demographic disruptions that are going on that we need to be mindful of as we think about our work. And if you look at it in terms of vital statistics, deaths versus births, 87 counties in North Carolina in 2019, for 87 counties, death succeeded births among the white population. Those counties in red on this map. 87 out of 100 of our counties, death succeeded births among white population in 2019. We have some major challenges, demographic challenges that we have to think about here. And I'd be, I'm gonna be interested and excited to hear you all uh, your thought processes as we process what all of this is. Only the orange counties on this map experienced where were places where more there were more births than deaths among non-Hispanic whites in North Carolina in 2019. The rest of the states, uh, rest of the counties, deaths exceeded births. Okay. And part of this deaths exceeding births reality that we're experiencing, white population loss we're experiencing is due to gale force wind gust number four, declining fertility. <clears throat> In a statistical sense, if, if you are a couple, you need to have 2.1 kids to replace yourself. It's a statistical average. You need to have 2.1 kids to replace yourself. That's called a total fertility rate. What you will notice in this graphic in 2019, there was only one group of women in America that had above replacement level fertility, and it was Native Hawaiian and, Earl and other Pacific Islanders. The, for all women and for every other group of women, the total fertility rate or the replacement rate was below 2.1. Why do we see these below replacement level rates of fertility? Well, the increasing role of women in the labor market, the growing career orientation of women, when women become uh, career oriented, uh, what typically happens is the age at marriage goes up. And what typically happens when the age at marriage goes up, the age at first childbirth goes up. And so you're reducing the number of years on the biological clock that is safe to have children. So women end up having fewer children uh, because of, <coughs> of work and career aspirations. People wait till later and getting their careers together before they have that first child. And as that as the, as the age increases, the number of years of safe to have children uh, decreases. And so women are having fewer children. And then there are an increasingly large number of women who are opting out, excuse me, of having children altogether. They're called the voluntary childless. And, and thirdly or fourthly, we have a large number of women who are aging out of the childbearing years. Uh, there's something in demography called completed fertility. Uh, completed fertility occurs between the ages of 40 and 44. There's this precipitous drop in fertility uh, between the ages of 40 and 44. And when you look at the data, uh, <clears throat> the median age of a non-Hispanic white female in America today is about 45 years old. Um, and women of color are 10 to 20 years younger than white women. Uh, but even among women of color, we are seeing declining fertility. But it is fairly clear that to the extent that uh, you're going to see births in the future, more and more of those births will be among 
uh, kids of color or uh, mixed race populations. And so that is one of the big things. We see this declining fertility uh, in our population. When you're not adding uh, people in the early phases of the life course, your population continues to age, you get older. At the same time that we have slowing total growth, slowing foreign growth and declining fertility in our society. These deaths of despair are the, are the other challenge that we're facing. This is my gale force win number five. What are these deaths of despair? Deaths due to suicide, alcohol, drug, and I now add the coronavirus related deaths that are creating a demographic depression for us in na nationally and in North Carolina. You know, we first identified the drug overdose crisis in 1999, these drug overdoses due to opioids and other things. Geographically, this map was what the drug overdose deaths looked like in 1999. That's what it looked like in 2014. 11,000 people hospitalized daily and well over 100 deaths every day due to drug overdoses in 2014. If we bring it closer to home, in 2017, there were 158,000 deaths of despair in the United States, the equivalent of three loaded Boeing 737 MAX jets falling out of the sky every day for a year. Who are these people vict falling victim to deaths of despair? They are 20 prime working age people, 25 to 44, with less than a college degree. Look at the map to the left. Look at the red places. Look at the orange places. Those are the high concentrations of people with less than a uh, 25 to 44 with less than a college degree. <clears throat> These are prime working age people that we need to fuel our economy, to pay in the social safety net systems of social security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all of those kinds of things, but they are falling prey to premature deaths in society, creating a major problem for us. And if you look at it in North Carolina and look at the opioid crisis in 2018, we distributed in North Carolina 445 million opioid pills. And as a function of that, that's about 43 pills per person because we're at a population of about 10 million people. That's 43 pills, uh, pills per person. And in 2018, there were five overdose deaths every day in the year. There were 18 hospital emergency department visits every day due to the opioid crisis. And about 10 people every day were brought back from, from death, uh, nonoxalone reversals and the like in North Carolina. And what does it look like geographically? Those red states, the number of pills per capita between 70 and 110 pills per capita uh, in those places with the full black circle uh, versus in those gray areas, you know, only 30 to 49 or less than 30 pills uh, distributed per day. What, what's going on? Where is this opioid crisis hitting the hardest? It is in many of our rural counties. Uh, and communities where we have high concentrations of a population with less than a college education, 25 to 44. Uh, we can't survive, thrive, and prosper when we're losing that many people uh, in their prime of their lives, or even if we don't lose them, if they become uh, disabled uh, they and they can no longer be contributing members of society. That's a huge, huge problem for us moving forward. We got to think about it. We got to figure it out. <clears throat> Complicating matters has been the coronavirus pandemic, as you all know and have experienced in your communities. Uh, we could talk at the outset about the racial disparate impact of the uh, COVID pandemic uh, with Blacks and Latinos and other people of color uh, suffering much more uh, 
in a worse condition than, than the non-Hispanic white population. And if you look at in terms of the impact on life expectancy, uh, what we knew at this point in time that COVID reduced uh, life expectancy among all races by about 1.1 years. Uh, for whites, it reduced life expectancy by about seven tenths of a year. But if you see the data by, uh, for Latinos and Blacks, it reduced life expectancy by three and two years respectively. Why? Because of the social determinants of health and uh, Blacks and Latinos being more uh, likely to be in occupations and the like that expose them uh, to the uh, dangerous virus, uh, living in uh, conditions that, that uh, made them vulnerable. And so this kind of, we have a situation where our population White population is declining. Our po total population is becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. But we have things like the COVID pandemic that's reducing life expectancy on that, that population. Again, it becomes the social determinants of health is something that we have to deal with head on uh, moving forward because of the larger impact on our economy and society of this thing. And what we know now is that the drug overdose crisis soared during the pandemic. CDC Center for Disease Control data show us that there were 90,000 drug overdose deaths in 2020, 30% increase or about 21,000 more than the death toll was in 2019. This is what one Stanford University expert on addiction and drug use abuse uh, said, he said, it's terrifying. It's the biggest increase in overdose deaths in the history of the United States. The worst overdose crisis in history. Uh, we're not making progress. It's really overwhelming. What happened during the pandemic? Uh, individuals who were struggling with, you know, drug addiction problems were on lockdown. That forced isolation kept them from in-person drug treatment, treatment and counseling services, and that proved to be deadly. What has been the long range consequence? We first identified the drug overdose crisis in the late 1990s. If you bring that forward to 2020, that brings the total number of people that we've lost, 25 to 44 to drug overdose crisis to about 900,000 people. Uh, that's a huge challenge for us when you look at the workforce and you look at the age structure and those are prime working age people that we're losing. They're, it's happening in your communities every day. We got to deal with it. The other issue that creates problems for us, uh, particularly on adding new talent to our society through births, normally in a shutdown, like some of you will remember you know, uh, uh, you know, a crisis like the utility shutdowns in New York, uh, the black blackouts in New York back in the day and the like. Normally what happens in a shutdown, nine months after the shutdown begins, there's usually a baby boom. People get busy doing shutdowns. That did not happen during the pandemic. What we know is, that there were, we had experienced 40,000 missing births due to the pandemic in the first month and a half of 2020. Those, what missing births are, the births that would have been likely to have been occurred in the absence of the pandemic, 40,000 short. And we're estimating that there will be 300,000 fewer births in 2021. All of that contributes to this slowing of total population growth uh, in our society, in our community. People, the last time we had above replacement level fertility in the United States was in the year 2008. For all women, the we've had below replacement level fertility. If we were to say that we maintained above replacement level fertility between 2009 and 2019, we would have an estimated 5.8 million more children in society today than we actually have. And these are the places due to 
uh, for, for, for women in these different categories, those are the declines in fertility or births that we've experienced as a function of below replacement level fertility. It's about 5.8 million fewer births than or children than we would have had had uh, above replacement level fertility uh, persisted. Uh, this is a major issue for us. And so we should not take great comfort about the boom that we're experiencing right now and growth through migration and a range of other things. These are the demographic headwinds that are out there more and then we'll talk about what all of this means. The other thing that we noticed in the pandemic were those things that I call involuntary retirements earlier and then declining female labor force participation. This is these are Gale Force wins number six and number seven. COVID reportedly forced 1.7 million people 55 or older into involuntary retirement and more than 2 million women out of the labor market. And those, it, you know, people, women who were faced with a dwindling supply of accessible and affordable childcare, these are working women who had to stop as schools transition to online learning to stay home and take care of their children. And childcare facilities, as many of you know, who are on the front line, suffered mightily during the pandemic. First of all, they suffered from a decline in their client base. Secondly, the cost of doing business went up sharply to comply with COVID precautions. And thirdly, many of them did not have a banking relationship or the business and tax records required to access payroll protection program dollars. And so uh, many child care businesses in North Carolina were trying to survive on credit cards. Uh, one child care uh, business owner we talked to with our focus groups um, said her cost went up $16,000 just to accommodate, you know, just to deal with the safety precautions, but she was serving half the number of kids that she had to serve before and she had, you know, quarantine issues with her employees and a whole range of other things. Uh, and women won't be able to go back to work until we figure out the childcare crisis. 51% of the US population lives in a childcare desert. And so this is something that uh, when we talk about worker shortages today, we're not gonna be able to solve it. Working mothers with young children are not gonna be able to go back to work until we figure out child care crisis. Those uh, 1.7 million workers 55 and older are more likely to be black than uh, any other group in society. These are people who uh, retired involuntarily, usually for a health risk or some other kinds of changes that they could not afford to take, but they retired with a median savings of $9,000. These folks got to go back to work, folks. They have to figure out how, uh, and we have to help them uh, get back into the labor market to uh, be able to avoid uh, experiencing and living in poverty for the remaining of their lives. So how do we think about those of us who care about these issues, who are at ground zero in these communities, seeing these uh, demographic gale force winds play out, how do we think about addressing them moving forward? It is pretty clear that, you know, and you look at all of the projections that this notion about slowing population growth is likely to continue in the future, uh, as you can see in this graphic. So um, this is a pretty predictable pheno phenomenon. And so the question is, uh, we're going to have basically we're going to have to do more with even less than we already have unless we think creatively about how to respond to these challenges on a daily basis. So what do we do? What do we think about? Uh, I think increasingly in a society where we talk about the great uh, resignation period that we're in where people are just quitting jobs and moving about and all of that kind of stuff. 
I think we have to uh, get people to understand that they need to audit their existing enterprises to ensure that they are inclusive and equitable places to work. Increasingly, whether you're in the nonprofit sector, the government sector, or the private sector, you're gonna have to have a demonstrated commitment to reputational equity. All of those things about equity and inclusion in the marketplace, we're going to, if we're gonna have a viable society, a well-honed, well-operating, uh, efficient operations, we're gonna have to be able to accommodate the disruptive demographic changes that are occurring. We know that as we become a more diverse society, as a majority of our population, uh, are black and brown people, living arrangements are far more diverse. Uh, black and brown people are far more likely to live in multi-generational households and they're both multi-generational opportunities and challenges in that process. We got to understand and align our realities and workplaces and work environments with the demographic realities of how our population is changing in terms of racial and ethnic composition, but also the living arrangements that undergird the, the those um, those uh, the, the shift in the demographics. And so we got to understand that. Good people, I quite frankly don't know how we deal with uh, the rural urban divide and population decline and death succeeding births in you know, 65 counties for the total population and 87 counties for the white population. I don't know how we survive if we don't think about how to reform immigration laws that allows more people to enter our state and uh, to play a critical role in our economy and our society. These are young people we are in an era of slowing total growth, white population loss, declining fertility, aging, and crisis-induced premature deaths of prime working age individuals. We're going to have, if we can't reproduce and create on our own the next generation of talent, the only option we have is to import it from other places and understand that there's value add in that whole notion. I think the other thing that we need to think about in our communities and the like as we deal, particularly in our rural communities, as we deal with aging issues for the local population, I think we have to, uh, just like we uh, engage in what I call the buffalo hunt, we try to recruit industries to communities and give them all kinds of breaks, tax breaks and the like to come locate in our communities. I think we all have to think about the utility of launching a bring back our own population of talent. People who grew up in our communities and have gone away and done really, really well, how do we incent them to come back home? There's never been a better time to do that than now because a lot of people who have gone away and done really, really well, they got aging parents and grandparents in these communities. And if we incent them to come back, uh, I think that that is going to be part and parcel of the talent that we are going to need to survive and thrive in these rural communities where no one, um, where it, it seems to, you know, population decline and loss is the order of the day. I know this is an important issue because a couple of years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at Cornell University in New York, and I was talking about aging and the like, and at the end of the lecture, and I was talking about elder care and how we had a lot of seniors that were isolated and lonely. At the end of the lecture, a person walked up to me and said, I'm from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and my mother still lives there, and I need uh, help with, uh, you know, services for her. It said, I will pay somebody to do that, but I can't leave right now because my son is in the 10th grade, but... <clears throat> But and I need to get him through high school. There are tons of opportunities to think about this notion of how do you bring back 
your own. Uh, I'm personally back in North Carolina from California because I had an aging grandmother that it was time for me to come back home to look after her. I was just fortunate to get an offer to come to Chapel Hill to work. But I think that that's something we have to think about on the policy side and advocate. We're going to need talent in a lot of these communities. I think the other thing, all of our organizations across the for-profit, nonprofit, and private sectors, we got to encourage family-friendly business policies that support women having children and allow them the flexibility to care for their offspring. Uh, you know, women are going to be the leaders in, uh, in, in society, uh, you know, both employees and leaders in all sectors of our economy, because we have a whole generation of males that have given up on college and, you know, education, more likely the sex ratio in higher education in our country is 60% female, 40% male. Uh, and that's across every kind of college and university you can think of. Um, and in some of our historically black colleges and universities, the sex ratio is 70% female, 30% male. Uh, and when you have that kind of sex ratio in the UNC system, we granted 45,000 more degrees to women than we did men between 2014 and 2019. What does that mean for professional women? There are not enough eligible marriageable males for them to form, you know, dual learner households and a whole range of other kinds of things. And then you have this whole generation of men who've given up on higher education. That begins in the K-12 education system. We got to think about those realities. We had one school several years ago that was 80% female, 20% male. I mean, that's these numbers and these kinds of changes we have to tack that, all that begins in preschool, but we can maybe we can have a conversation about that. I think we also, and this is where I see you all playing a major role in society. You do some of this, but I think we have to rev it up. I think we have to attack the childcare crisis head on and we got to, you know, seed the expansive childcare deserts in our state uh, with accessible, high quality and affordable daycare. And we got to equip those facility owners and operators with the strong business acumen, acumen that they need. So when the next crisis they confront, they'll have the business and tax records. They'll have the relationship with the banking system so that they can take advantage of the supports that are available to, to maintain viable businesses. We have just started a, something called a child care business accelerator uh, uh, that will work with existing child care business owners and aspiring child care business owners to equip them with the business acumen that they need to build high performance, sustainable uh, facilities. And we also have a child care fellows program that works with uh, child care workers and move their job responsibilities from child care to child development. Those are two different things. And and to ensure we're experiencing with a wage supplement for the childcare workers of $1,400 a month, because we have to demonstrate to uh, the state and to the federal government and to corporation that these this is honorable work and people need to be paid uh, livable wages for doing the honorable work. And it's not going to happen until we, uh, uh, employers are not going to be able to address their workforce needs until we deal with the child care crisis. This is one you all have experience in. This is one I think that we can uh, grab the, the, you know, the horns of the problem and, and really deal with it. I think you all, uh, because I also think you've dealt with the depths of despair in your communities, that we need thinking and policy advocacy about how do we address these depths of despair. We cannot continue to lose the prime working age demographic to premature deaths in our community. Uh, what facets of those social determinants of health do we take on to uh, be able to address those kinds of issues? And I think there's a wonderful opportunity given that 55 plus population that uh, is involuntarily retiring uh, how do we get them back into the workplace? How do we create these encore career opportunities 
and encore business opportunities for that 55 plus population who was forced out during the COVID, how we bring them in back in. It seems to me that it's a win-win that employers who are uh, who will look to this, this group of people, they're the most reliable group of workers in our history. They're accustomed to working hard. And the like, how do we get the employers to understand the value add that you get from that worker group? And uh, how do we make sure that they are able to make money and to sustain themselves moving forward? Aside from these issues, I think what I would say, and this is based on the, the work that we did uh, with the North Carolina Community Action Association, there's a post-pandemic cliff out there of people who have benefited from all of the resources that you as community action agents have been able to provide during the crisis, that the state government has been able to provide and that the federal government has been able to provide. How are we positioning ourselves to deal with that post-pandemic cliff when all of those resources disappear and we still have a population that is struggling. There are, a recent study just came out, about a million people in the nation who are COVID long haulers. These are people who are after a year or so with exposure to COVID still have debilitating symptoms of the disease and lots of them are struggling to work every day and others just cannot go back to work. We gotta figure out how to address the post pandemic cliff uh, moving forward uh, in our work. We have never taken a back seat to these kinds of challenges. And I think, and what I say is having worked with some of you and have had feedback from you on how you responded to COVID. Uh, I know that community action agencies are poised to do the work. And I think that uh, we have to figure out, those of us in higher education and the like, we have to figure out how to work with you to make these things happen uh, that need to happen. And we have to reframe the debate about poverty and inequality uh, yeah, it's a moral issue. It's a, it's a major issue in our society. But at the end of the day, poverty alleviation is a competitiveness issue. We're going to lose our shirt in the global marketplace in this state and in this nation if we don't deal with the problems that you all deal with every day, seven days a week, during six or five days of the year. Uh, and if we don't work together to help you all do even more than all of the great work that you're already doing. So it's within that spirit and context that I shared with you all where the pup, the demographic pup is headed. I think now the hard work begins of thinking about how are we responsive to those forces and how do we leverage the good work and scale much of the work that you're doing to ensure that these demographic wind gusts do not turn into an adverse demographic weather event that we can no longer control. We're up to the task, I believe, because you all would not be doing this work if you didn't care deeply and dearly about the people that are on the, the short end of the stick, as it were, in terms of a pandemic and other kinds of crises. I would leave you with the last thought that I hear lots of people say, I can't wait till we return to some semblance of normalcy. What I would say to you, and I think many of you know this, the new normal is what we are experiencing. It may not be a pandemic, but there will be other kinds of crises that we're going to have to face, to deal with on a daily basis. The leadership challenge for all of you is, how do you figure out how to groove on ambiguity? Because that's the nature of the landscape, the political landscape that we're dealing with, and that's the nature of the, un the volatility of the marketplace that we're operating in. We're gonna have to figure out how to peer through the fog of uncertainty and identify propitious opportunities to be taken advantage of and the landmines to be avoided. You all know this early and often every day. And uh, I welcome the opportunity to engage in a discussion on some of these issues. Nafia, that's 
my takeaway. Dr. Johnson, once again, <laughs> you have given us so much information to try and uh, digest, so much good information. Um, the chat box was uh, kind of going off a little bit <laughs> through okay. so much of your, um, your discussion. Um, some really great ideas, people commenting about how heartbreaking so much of the information you shared was, mm -hmm. um, shocking. Um, let me see where I can sort of start with some of the questions that we had come through. We have a few minutes before we go into a break, but we can we can we can go into the break a little bit because I think a lot of people. Wow, yes, lots of stuff coming in. Thank you, great information, really awesome, um, and thank you all. So many of you. I, I know you're not necessarily able to see how many people are here, but there's quite a lot of folks in here, mm -hmm. um, and I see from some of the names a lot of people who are some leaders across the network, um, people who are working every day with children mm -hmm. and families, people who are on the boards of some of these agencies working with children and families. So lots of really great information sharing uh, back and forth. Um, let's see. Also, just a note, everyone in the chat box, if you scroll up, there will be an evaluation. If you could just take that, that would be great and helpful and another great place to share some um, information we must rethink childcare and public education um mm -hmm. one of the comments about your 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 point about men in education is that getting young males straight out of high school to understand the importance of a higher education has become more difficult than ever before um also just a note to everyone we are recording all of the sessions for the symposium all of those recordings will be made available to you. Um, Dr. Johnson has so generously shared his slides with us to share with you. So those will also be made available since I see a lot of questions about that. I'm also getting some personal direct messages. I'm trying to <laughs> keep everything. Um, so here's a question to you, Dr. Johnson. If we look at other nations and societies, um, how have they survived these challenges or what's happened to them? I guess sort of, you know, what's going to happen to us when we're seeing mm -hmm. all these numbers? Mm -hmm. So uh, very good question. And thanks so much for asking it. Um, so if, you know, these are global issues that we're talking about. Uh, we are in an era, for example, of global aging. The only region of the world that isn't experiencing aging is Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's because of the AIDS crisis. Last couple of years ago, Japan sold more adult diapers than they did baby diapers. Wow. Okay, so this aging phenomenon is something that's global. And the thing that I didn't even have a chance to talk about is climate migration. You know, you, we have these vulnerable regions and areas of the world and the country that people are voting with their feet from those places to other communities inland and the like. Well, that whole notion of that I talked about earlier of, you know, gentrification and uh, how do we deal and balance that process with the existing residents who've been there working hard every day and the like, that becomes a challenge. That's where policies come into place. But many of the things that I talked about at the local level and in the U.S. are actually global realities. We just didn't have time to, you know, to put the global lens on them, but um, they, they are real issues globally. That is... So much to take in. It's a lot to take in. So many people talking about great information. I'm seeing some really, some ideas of people, people talking mm -hmm. about uh, working with people struggling with suicidal thoughts, being more attentive, yep. working with families. And yep. FYI, to give you guys a preview of some of the things that are coming this week, um, you know, we've, we've hit you with a lot of intense information today, um, I think, to sort of bring the reality of where we're all starting. Um, but we're all, we are a solutions-based office here at NCCAA. We are outcomes-based. And so he ended with some solutions. And so the rest of this week is really going to be about You've got this information now about where we're starting. Let's let's talk about how we can better work with families um, and, and 
and help them deal with these crises and also take better care of ourselves. Because um, Agatha, you, you bring up a great point. So many of us, we're all living through this time. Um, we're not just serving people living through it. We're living through it as well. So sometimes we can be struggling as well. And so learning how to also take care of ourselves right. in the midst of all this so that we can better care for the people that we're trying to serve so that we don't get lost in the shuffle. Um, so much, so much good information. Any but other Nafi, direct if I, if questions? I might, Nafi, if I can add a point there that the one thing that when we did the, the lived experiences of COVID, the other thing that came out strongly in our focus groups when we talked to leaders of community action agencies that you all became a model of the caring organization for your staff and the like. And that's an important thing that um, I, I think in a pandemic, you know, we talk about struggles all the time, but we also, I think you all need to think about the really great things you did to maintain your staff and to be supportive uh, and thoughtful and accommodating of the challenges that our staff experience. The worker shortage today is because we haven't been accommodating of the challenges and opportunities in a uh, society and a uh, com uh, set of communities where family structure is changing dramatically. You know, very few organizations have any accommodations for, uh, for elder care in their HR policies. They talk about child care. The big issue moving forward is going to be elder care and 11 million millennials have elder care responsibilities. You look at your workforce and you people look all cross-eyed when a millennial walks in and says, I got to take care of grandma or granddad. It's real. It's real. And so take pat yourself on the back for some of the work that you're doing with your own staff and employees. And tell somebody else when you're making appeal for resources for how they should do things. I think that that's important. Absolutely. It, Tanya mentioned earlier uh, one of her comments that thank God OHS paid staff during the closing mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. agencies and organizations mm -hmm. that understood the importance of taking care of their people throughout this. One other question that has come to me um, is we're experiencing so many challenges with men, especially black men who are becoming disengaged. Oop, I lost it. <laughs> um, how can people uh, succeed with males participating even when cont uh, without contributing to fertility? So um, I guess the question really is, if we're not growing the population with fertility, how can we at least get the men to be more engaged? Um, this person, particularly black men. It's, great. it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I think we have to recognize that the problem that we see uh, at, you know, in young black men that are, you know, 18 and older, those problems started in preschool. Okay. And, you know, we have, uh, what is it, a 11 million kids suspended uh, and expelled from school annually, and a quarter of a million of them referred to the police for misdemeanor charges as early as the first grade. And that's now moving down to preschool, and they are far more likely that those, those get referred to the police for misdemeanor charges of black and brown males. What happens when you get a misdemeanor charge in kindergarten? It follows you the rest of your life. And, and so we have to look at that male problem through the entire life course. And then for those uh, young men, uh, I, I wrote a paper recently uh, of, uh, it's about, you know, what do you need in your toolkit in a society that is not designed for us, okay? What do you need in your toolkit to navigate in a system that is not designed for us? There are some specific things that I think that we need to work with males of color to help them navigate in a society that's really not designed for us. And, and, and so I, 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 I wanna spend a lot of my time in doing that. Um, and we have developed some training programs for those kinds of things that kids need in their toolkits uh, to weather 
you know, and navigate in in a turbulent kind of marketplace and uh, landscape. Uh, um, we don't have time to talk about all of them today, but that would be my answer to the question. But look at early childhood education and then fix those problems early childhood and then talk about a sustained engagement education system with those kids that uh, allow boys of color. We, we, we have an education system that is a, a holdover from the agrarian era. And we have an education system that puts kids in a box. And when they don't fit, we say they have attention deficit disorder. You know, the most creative people in the world have attention deficit disorder. They're on to the next thing because, you know, they're, they have these flowering minds. We have to create an education system where kids have the ability to think crazy thoughts. Nine out of 10 of them may be bona fide crazy. One of them may be the next revolution that transformed the world. When we put them in a box, they don't fit. Then we send them off to another box called the prison system. And that's not right. So a couple more questions and then we will. Uh, <laughs> my screen, you don't see what I'm seeing, Dr. Johnson. I'm getting lots of private chats and private information. <laughs> <laughs> I see the number of chat responses keeps, you get. It just keeps moving. Um, but everyone, just a note, um, there is, I did just try and re-put it back in the chat box. If you scroll up just a bit, you will see the link to the evaluation. Um, we've got another question uh, that came in to thank you, Dr. Johnson, for the, your hard work um, and your deep work and the constructive presentation. Uh, what is the impact of birth control in population as a declining issue? And I think that's going to be our last, our last question that we'll be able to get in there. Um, I'm sure it plays a role, but uh, I, 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 I'm not sure what facet of impact uh, are you saying is the question, is that responsible for the declining fertility rate? I think probably if, if, if um, you know, birth control is affecting the declining fertility rate in any, in any measurable, reasonable term, way. Uh, I would say, yeah. I mean, if, if, uh, if you are, if you read Hannah Rosen's book, The End of Men, uh, if men don't have, uh, comparable education and levels and the like, you know, women are saying, you know, what's love got to do with it? You got to protect yourself. And so birth control is, is important in all of this and, and it's a right for people. So uh, I, I do think that, I, I think that there, there, there are other issues that, yeah. the, I think the increasing role of women in the workplace and career orientation, but I do think the huge sex ratio imbalance and uh, something called the MMPI, the, the, the male marriageable pool index is not on the side of women. And so birth control is important. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Johnson. Thank you 